Welcome to uh, today's webinar session on benchmarking and risk management. Uh, my name is Dr. Adam Rabinowitz, and I am at the University of Georgia now, formerly at the University of Connecticut. And uh, this, this webinar is being provided by UConn Extension, uh, with special thanks to Farm Credit East and Crop Growers LLP. And so as a, a full acknowledgement, uh, I'd like to just say that this program is a cooperative effort of UConn Extension, the Connecticut Department of Agriculture, and the Risk Management Agency, USDA. Uh, thank you to Farm Credit East and Crop Growers LLP for their participation in, in bringing this together. And, and Joe Benelli, uh, Associate Ed Extension Educator at UConn Department of Extension uh, for, for sort of organizing this and, and really spearheading the idea of a benchmarking and risk management webinar uh, to bring this information to Connecticut farmers and others in the Northeast. So today's presenters will be uh, myself, Dr. Adam Rabinowitz. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm assistant professor and extension specialist down at the University of Georgia. Uh, some of you may may have known me. I, I was until just uh, about a month ago at the University of Connecticut uh, at the Zwick Center for Food and Resource Policy and the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics, and, and uh, always a husky at heart. So we we'll also have today Chris Lawton, who is the director of Knowledge Exchange at Farm Credit East and Peter Frizzell, Senior Marketing Agent at Crop Growers LLP. So an outline for today's presentation, uh, I'd like to talk about first, what is benchmarking and how it can help you improve your business. We'll then go through some examples of benchmarks and then a review of risk management strategies for Connecticut farms, including crop insurance programs. Before I get started on benchmarking, I would like to, to just put out there my contact information and follow up. Uh, so my email address is there, adam.rabinowitz at uga.edu. And today's webinar session is available for viewing at ctfarmrisk.ucon.edu. And as a follow-up to this webinar, I have planned a live video conferencing session for September 21st at 1 p.m. So if you are interested in attending this help session, uh, please email me with questions you'd like answered or the type of help with benchmarking that you're looking to receive. And I will respond with details uh, for the video conferencing access. And so we hope that this you know, could be a, a beginning of a, a series of interactions that we may be able to have uh, to try to bring more information about benchmarking uh, to farmers in Connecticut. And so to start with, I'd like to discuss sort of the idea, what is benchmarking? Right? I've mentioned this term a few times already. And, so really want to start with a definition. It is this process used to compare performance of your business. And so, you know, by process, I'm going to pick out these words, process requires some type of metric, right? It's a computation of a number. It's some quantification of your business practice. And so, you know, this is a very important because a successful benchmark exercise requires comparing like with like, or apples with apples, if you will. Uh, we, you know, we need to use the same method of computing whatever outcome we're looking to compare. And so that brings me to my next term, the idea of this comparison to compare. One must have some alternative. And so it might be your business during a different time period. It might be other businesses in your industry. Uh, it could be single businesses in your industry, or it could be an aggregate in some fashion. Um, it might be your own goals or industry goals or business plans that you may have that you're looking to compare against. These would all be comparisons in a form of benchmarking. Uh, performance is the other component of this definition, and that's where we have our outcome measure. What is it that you want to benchmark? Right? It could be profits, income, cost of production, or really any practice for which you want to look for improvement in your business. Uh, often benchmarking is discussed as a financial measure, which is really what we'll focus on here today, uh, but it can include any component of your business, including, for example, environmental practices. All right, so it's all about the process that you use to compare some performance of your business, and then ultimately the improvements that you make from that. So why do we actually do benchmarking? And so we do benchmarking to identify areas for improvement. 
Right? We want to understand other businesses and better understand your own business and ultimately to improve your own performance. And so whatever outcome measure is of concern, right? it's about how can you improve that performance. And so benchmarking can lead to increased profits, it can lead to better profitability, or improved efficiency in your business, ultimately improving your competitive position in your industry. There are a couple of different methods for benchmarking that we can talk about. And, you know, we can start with the idea of just benchmarking against yourself. This can be very quick and informative. If you keep good business records, especially, then it's easy to do comparisons over time. Right? We can think about how you, do your current performance measures compare to your past. Maybe if in a time when we're experiencing a drought, uh, how does it compare to other periods of time when there was also a similar you know, weather phenomenon? We can think about what are the reasons why you might be performing better or worse than before. Right? And are there new strengths or weaknesses compared to prior periods? With strengths and weaknesses, we also have opportunities and threats. Right. Are there any opportunities that might allow you to leverage your strengths for better performance? Or are there threats that when combined with your weaknesses are going to compromise your business? Right. Benchmarking against yourself can really be quick, but it is also difficult to know what to do to improve performance. So it can be best to go outside your, your own bubble, if you will, right, and see what others are doing. And that's where we think about a method of benchmarking against others. Right, where you're comparing your performance against others in your industry. And we ask those same questions, though. How does your current performance measure compare to others in your industry? What are the reasons why you might be performing better or worse than others in your industry? And are there strengths or weaknesses compared that you have, your business has, compared to others in your industry? And so the question of how can you do benchmarking then uh, you know, there are two ways that we can kind of think about, informal or formal. And the informal way is, you know, you're probably doing this already. You're, you're talking to other farmers, uh, you know, maybe about their price they received for their harvest or introduction of a new technology that reduced costs. You might be hearing stories possibly from extension educators or at trade shows or others in the industry on farm performance. Or you might just be walking around someone else's farm. Right. Formal benchmarking can improve performance, but it's not the most efficient approach. So we think about a more systematic approach, a formal approach, where we want to identify similar farms. These could be an average of all other farms in your industry or a sampling of other farms in your industry, or maybe it's targeted at just those that are high performers. Right. We could study similar farms in detail at that point, we really want to understand if we're talking about financial metrics or any performance measure, we want to get into to very fine details about what actually is happening with those farms. So we can then compare the performance. Right. We need to understand the reasons for these differences and the full process of formal benchmarking, of course, can be time consuming and difficult to achieve. Um, but you know, we can look to others that may have some readily available data that we can use. And that's something that, that Chris will talk a little bit about with respect to Farm Credit East and some of the data that they have uh, you know, that can help with that more formal approach to benchmarking. But whether it's informal or formal, the ultimate goal to keep in mind is that you want to introduce change in your farm to ultimately improve your performance. So if we think about successful benchmarking, you need to make sure you're collecting and recording accurate data on your farm's performance because any outcome of a benchmarking activity is only going to be as good as the data that goes into it. Bad data in, bad out outcome from it. So you want to make sure that you have good, accurate data on your own farm's performance and then ultimately accurate and comparable data from potentially industry leaders like Farm Credit East. We can use the same methodology 
for your farm or own farm records as is used to comparison data. And it's important that you do use that same methodology because again, it's necessary to compare like with like or apples with apples, right? If the unit of production is per acre for the comparison data and your farm records are computed by bushel of apples, you cannot do that comparison. You need to make sure that you're using a similar methodology. And you want to look for key performance indicators that are important to you, but also those that are available. And so when is a good time for benchmarking? Well, there's no one best time, right? Unlike tax season, there's no, it's not March or April that you, know, you need to, to, to get that done, right? You really can conduct a benchmarking activity all the time at all stages of your business practice. Um, and so really, I, I like to say, if you don't make the time, you won't find the time. So now is the best time to go ahead and, and start that benchmarking activity and see what you can do to improve the performance of your farm through that comparison of performance metrics to others in the industry and, and those that are, are, are potentially, uh, you know, going to give you the information of how you stand against uh, either some average performance or some better performance and where you can think about where you may need to then make some changes. And so with that, I'd like to, to pass it along to Chris Lawton at Farm Credit East, so he can discuss some of the benchmarking data that they have and how you can actually use uh, you know, th those data for your own benchmarking activities. My name is Chris Lawton from Farm Credit East. I'm Director of Knowledge Exchange here. And um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate a few things that Adam said. Um, benchmarking just basically means comparing yourself against some kind of standard. And that standard can take different forms. Um, one of the most basic things you can do is benchmarking against yourself over time. Um, I come from a nursery greenhouse background. And one of the things that I remember is the way my father used to benchmark our business. And there were a, a few ways which we did it. One was he would benchmark himself against our own business over time. So we'd look at um, financial as well as production metrics uh, my dad used to keep a detailed diary of things that he did and financial results. And so we'd look at, you know, spring weekends and what our sales were and how that compared to the year before and whether it was up or down and we'd think about why. Uh, we'd also look at production metrics, um, things like what temperature we kept the, the greenhouses at, uh, what the results of that were, if, did, you know, if we kept the house a little cooler, did it extend the production timeline, um, you know, different things like that so we could learn from ourselves over time. Um, another thing that we used to do is my dad had a, a, a trusted friend that was in the, in the same industry, but he was far enough away that he wasn't in direct competition. And my dad used to compare books with him on a quarterly basis and look at areas where each one of them were doing better or worse and um, use that to, to benchmark himself that way. So if you're lucky enough to have some trusted peers, um, that can be a really good thing too. And finally, before I go on to my slides, um, fully half of the benefit, in my opinion, of benchmarking is what, that it forces you to get your own financial records in such a state as which, as which you can compare them to a standard. So it forces you to, to formalize your finance, financial statements and have them in a consistent format in a way that's useful to compare to. And just the exercise of that alone uh, is a very worthwhile exercise for a lot of businesses. So with that said, I'm, I'll go into my slides now. Um, benchmarks, you know, like Adam said, there's a lot of benefits to it. I think one of the big things is that it can help you reality check your budgets and your results by showing you what's achievable in the real world. Uh, benchmarking yourself can show you areas where you're doing well as well as areas where you have room for improvement. I think a lot of uh, farm producers have a, a vague sense that their results are not what they'd like them to be, but they're not sure where to start to start making improvements, and benchmarking can really help you 
uh, help you get there. They can help you show you that, okay, my, my labor as a percent of sales looks a little high, but my, um, my fuel costs are a little low or, you know, what have you, and it'll give you an idea of some specific areas to focus on. So another thing to remember is that the benchmark is an average of the businesses in it. Half do better and half do worse. So the benchmark will show you, you know, if you're using a, an industry standard benchmark, it'll show you what's realistic and what's achievable for that industry. But keep in mind that there's gonna be a wide range of results that go into it. Um, it's not a guarantee that you'll achieve those results. Remember half of the farms in it do worse than what the benchmark is. Um, and moreover than that, ideally you should strive to be better than average. Uh, the average is after all only the top of the bottom. Um, there's half of the farms in there that are doing better than that average and you'd like to be one of those. So now getting into an example of, of an actual benchmark and, and ways to use it, um, I'll, I'll show you an example of one of Farm Credit East benchmarks, wholesale vegetables. We benchmark a number of industries, which I'll talk about in a minute, but this is one that I'm using just as a, an example to talk about. Um, if you happen to be a Farm Credit East customer, we can prov provide you with a customized report that show your own financials against the benchmark. But even if you're not a Farm Credit East customer, uh, we provide these benchmarks free of charge to basically anyone that asks, them on, asks for them on request. Um, so we make them available publicly at no cost. Um, so just to highlight a few things, in the, and this is the top of page one of a, a benchmark report statement, the way we format it. Uh, first is number of farms. In this case, it's 15 farms are in the benchmark. Um, that's not a great number. I'd like to see it be more. We're constantly trying to get more farms in our benchmark programs. Um, but it's not, it's not a terrible number either. But, you know, it's, it's 15 businesses, so it's a, you know, a, a decent slice of companies. Uh, if it gets a lot below 10, um, there's, you start to have risk that a few outliers could start to skew the data. Um, but, you know, 15 is an acceptable number to, to start with. Ideally, it would be more. Um, but anyway, here we have sales that are broken down in different categories. And for our benchmarks, we basically just compile them as they're reported to us. So different farms account for revenue in different ways. But as we can see here, crops grown are the main revenue stream for wholesale vegetable farms. But there is a line item for gross resale products sold. So most farms are buying at least some product to supplement what they're producing. Um, refunds are typically co-op dividends. Um, farm Credit East customers get a portion of their interest back in, as a refund. Um, dairy co-ops also distribute money that way. Um, there's other sources of refunds and government programs could be things like um, grants or um, subsidy programs or things like that. Um, if we notice, there's a couple of different ways this is broken down. The first column is raw dollars and we see that this farm has about $1.6 million in revenue. Um, the challenge, one, one of the challenges I should say in benchmarking is that often you're comparing businesses that are not the same size. But this is where the other two columns come in handy. We can look at numbers as a percent of sales, and we can also look at numbers um, per acre. And here we have total tillable acres, so the acres cultivated, and that gives you some numbers here. So we can see that this, that the average vegetable farm in the benchmark got about $4,700 per cultivated acre in gross revenue. Um, obviously, the, the total sales number would equal 100% of sales. And then when we start to go down and look at expenses, we can see that, like, for example, Chemicals typically run about 2% of sales or, you know, close to $92 per acre. If we go down that uh, financial statement and we look at expenses here, we can see that we've split them into variable and fixed expenses. Variable expenses are your expenses that vary directly with the product you're producing. Things like, um, well, examples here, chemicals, fertilizers, uh, fuel, direct production labor, uh, seeds and plants, that kind of thing. Um, your gross revenue minus your total variable expenses gives you your gross margin. And your gross margin is what you have to cover overhead and profits after you've paid all your costs of production. So in this case, we can see that this average wholesale vegetable grower, about 42% of their um, revenues were expended in direct production costs. That leaves 
roughly 58% uh, for overhead recovery and for profits. Or to put it another way, of the $4,700 in gross revenue that that average vegetable farm produced per acre, uh, close to 2,000 of it was spent on direct production labor. And I just wanted to highlight a few things on the variable expenses. Labor is, is the number one expense, or number one or two expense for almost all agriculture. Um, things like seed um, and some of your supplies and things like that really aren't that significant. We often see um, farms kind of overestimating what their supply costs are and underestimating what their labor costs are. And a benchmark can help you, you know, again, reality check that. So further down on the, on the line, we see fixed expenses, and those are your things that um, also called overhead, which don't typically vary directly with production, or if they do vary, they vary in steps as you scale up. Um, the big, or one of the big ones is depreciation. And because that's so significant, you wanna make sure if you're benchmarking yourself that you're comparing your depreciation, you're calculating your depreciation the same way the benchmark is. So for purposes of benchmarking at Farm Credit East, we normalize the, the depreciation in that we take uh, machinery and equipment and do, it a, do a straight line eight year um, depreciation on it. So that's how we get the depreciation. That takes out the effects of any kind of uh, accelerated depreciation schemes or tax planning um, depreciation um, programs that a farm might have that kind of uh, overestimate depreciation to reduce tax li liability. Those things can be useful for tax filing, um, but they're gonna make your financial statements wacky. If, so you don't wanna use those, those kinds of um, depreciation schemes when you're, when you're benchmarking, whether it's against a standard like this or even against yourself, because it's gonna vary widely by year. Um, but here we can see things like, you know, overhead expenses, typical overhead expenses like uh, Vehicle expense, depreciation, insurance, interest, rent, those are things that don't um, typically vary a lot with how much uh, you produce. They're the things that you need just to keep the lights on in the business. And those typically run almost 30% uh, in, in the case of wholesale vegetables, so that's something to consider. So after your, your, your variable expenses are subtracted from your gross revenue, that gives you a gross margin. You take your fixed expenses from that, that gives you your net margin. In this case, it's 12, a little over 12% of total revenue, total sales, or about $576 per acre. So that gives us a rough idea of, um, let's say you're thinking about going into the wholesale vegetable business, that gives you a rough idea of what you might expect to, re to achieve in terms of real world results. Um, if you see that the benchmark is net margin is 12% and you think you're going to get 25%, um, you need to really think about, you know, what are you doing that's different than what everyone else is doing that's going to help you get there. Um, you know, again, it gives you a, a, a reality basis for your, for your budgeting. So if we go further down the, on the page of the benchmark, we get our total fixed expenses and our net margin, like I talked about, the 12%. And then because farms um, in agriculture, where the farm ends and where the family begins is often a blurry line. A lot of farms use a lot of family labor. Um, their owner, draw, they don't draw a salary directly. They have an owner draw out of profits. Um, so we track the things like net non-farm income, which is typically a spouse's occupation, uh, or perhaps the farmer himself has a part-time job or herself has a part-time job. Um, in this case, most it's notable that even though these are quite large farms, remember we had uh, like $1.7 million in average sales, um, most of these farms had pretty significant net non-farm income. So they're, um, to support their family living, they're relying on not just the farm for income, but an off-farm an off job as well. Um, we can see the family living expense there. And then there was a, a line for income and social security taxes. And then the net from operations, that's after everything is paid. And then it's net of both non-farm income and family living. And we can see that that's the, the net result of that family's enterprise, if you will, came to about 10% of, of total sales, or $462.09. So 
that gives you a rough idea of what a, a bench, you know, what, a, what one of our benchmarks looks like. Uh, but we're not the only game in town. Uh, well, before I get to that, I'll, let's talk about some other things in a benchmark. Um, a benchmark will often include some ratios or production attributes that you can use to look at to, to see how you compare to the farm in the benchmark. In this case, it's a wholesale vegetable benchmark, so we can see that, no surprise, most of the sales come from wholesale sales. But, you know, 7%, so a significant minority of companies may do some retail sales as well. Um, here we look at the acres owned and rented. Most of our operations are renting fairly significant acreage as well as what they own. Um, the average in the benchmark for tillable acres is 334. And then we can see things like their debt per acre owned and debt per tillable acre. Um, that's important to keep your finances in line. And lenders will look at that as well. If you're, you know, if the benchmark average debt per acre is 3,500, and you're at 5,000, they're gonna really question whether you're gonna be able to meet that debt service. Um, here we have some other metrics like expenses and labor. Um, we have one labor expense plus family living, which is especially important for smaller operations where they use a lot of family labor. You wanna factor that into the equation. Then there's some profitability metrics and some labor metrics. Um, things like return on assets, depreciation as a percent of sales, uh, net farm income, your profit margin, and then worker full-time equivalents. That's basically the, if you converted your workers, seasonal, part-time, full-time, the whole, the whole uh, group of them into year-round full-time equivalents, working you know, 40 hours a week year-round, the average farm had 14 of those. Um, in reality, that probably means that they might have had like five in the winter and they might have 20 in the summer, but that gives a rough idea if you converted it out. Um, it's notable what they're producing an in income per full-time worker to afford those workers. It's uh, about $111,000. So that, you know, again, that gives you an idea. If your farm is producing, say, $50,000 in vegetables, it might be hard for you to um, afford a lot of labor because the average farm is, is earning over 100,000 in gross sales per worker equivalent. Um, and you can see the labor expense per full-time worker equivalent is about 27,000. So that gives you some ideas of, of how that farm is operating. Um, as I mentioned, we're not the only game in town, Farm Credit East, that is. Um, I just did some, some web searching for um, agricultural benchmarks as well as Another way you could search for the same thing roughly is by looking at cost of production for different crops. Um, this is from University of Minnesota, and this is uh, a soybean benchmark on cash rent, and here they have a, a huge farm sample, uh, and they break it down by different types of tillage, whether it's mold board, no-till, ridge till, whatever. And so you can see the number of acres that they have, their yields per acre, and then all their direct expenses, and it goes on down from there. So. I mean, one of the things that you'll find, I think, if you search for benchmarks or cost of production studies is that there's, there's quite a few for um, commodity crops like, like um, corn, soybeans, wheat, that kind of thing. There's some for dairy out there. That, those are not that hard to find. Um, it's a lot more difficult for things like mixed vegetables, for example, because the operations are so variable. And also, many of them are Midwestern focused. So it's important to keep that in mind that the results achieved in the Midwestern part of the U.S. may be different than what is achieved in the Northeast. Um, that doesn't mean they're not useful. It can be very useful to, you know, compare yourself and see what other farmers in different parts of the country are doing, but, um, you know, just something to keep in mind. So that's the University of Minnesota benchmark. They have others, but I just pulled up a soybean one. Um, Iowa State University has some, um, they call it alternative agricultural financial benchmarks, and you can see they have different mixed vegetables for CSA and non-CSAs, fruits, organic row crops, pasture, poultry, et cetera. So that's Iowa State University. Um, again, this is also from Iowa State University, the, um, an example of the mixed vegetable um, CS, non-CSA model standard. And so they talked about, you know, what you need to do to attain $30,000 in net farm income, um, some of the different capital outlays uh, USDA, ER, the Economic Research Service has some, uh, they refer to them as cost of production studies, but it's 
It's a very similar concept. It, it shows the, the cost to produce different crops and the expense side at least. And they have things like corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, different um, you know, major crops. Uh, just another one, Michigan State has some different, different ones. You can see here they have crops, fruits, vegetables, orchard, nursery, greenhouse, livestock. So I don't, want to, I don't want people to think that Farm Credit East is the only source out there. There are others if you search online. Um, but having said that, for the Northeast, for a lot of crops, uh, we may be the best source. Um, so we have benchmark solutions programs, which are available, as I said, free of charge. My email is on the screen. Anyone that's viewing this uh, recording can email me and request a copy of them. Um, we have them for dairy, what we call agricultural retail, which is farm markets and garden centers, uh, cash field crops, equine, greenhouse, lobster, nursery, orchard fruit, potatoes, and vegetables. And those are for wholesale producers. Um, if you're more than 50% retail, we'd refer you to the ag retail uh, benchmark. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that we have some paid programs for benchmarking. Uh, for ag retail, dairy, winery, and green industry. We have what we call our success strategies benchmarks programs. These are a fee-for-service based program. You do not need to be a loan customer to participate in them, however. And they do not just financial benchmarking, but a much deeper dive into production metrics uh, for their respective industries. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Pete Frizzell, who's gonna talk about um, crop insurance and risk management. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, opportunity uh, for me to be a part of this and uh, provide some useful information on uh, crop insurance geared towards Connecticut agricultural community. Uh, my name is Pete Frizzell. I am a senior marketing agent for Crop Growers LLP. My job here is to educate agricultural producers in the New England region on a variety of risk management products that are designed to protect capital investments in the crop and help preserve farm equity for future generations. Uh, six risk management strategies I'm going to talk about today are production history policies, fresh market sweet corn, crop kale coverage, whole farm revenue protection, also called WFRP, pasture rangeland and forage, and livestock gross margin dairy. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to keep this as simple as I can and cover just the just the broad basics because there's a lot of information that goes along with these cr different crop insurance plans. Um, my contact information will be available at the conclusion of this presentation for future inquiries in crop insurance and questions pertaining to any of the plans I go over today. So starting off with production history policies. Okay, these are risk management strategies that provide production against a production shortfall or failure to sell the crop due to quality issues. Uh, these policies make up about 90% of my risk management plans that I deal with. Um, so these are plans that are based on your average crop production history yields of either five years for apples and peaches or 10 years for uh, commodities like corn, potatoes, and tobacco. Uh, production history can be tracked as a whole or production insurance can be broken out for individual farm serial numbers. Okay. You can choose uh, coverage percentiles ranging from 50 to 85% at 5% increments, which also, you know, the maximum varies per crop. Uh, the deadlines for signing up for this production-based policy is uh, November 20th for apple and peaches, and for corn, potatoes, and tobacco, March 15th. Uh, insurable crops for the production history policies include apples, uh, corn grain, and corn silage, Peaches, which are only insurable in Litchfield and Middlesex counties, potatoes only in Hartford County, and tobacco is only insurable in Hartford and Tallinn counties. Uh, perils that these policies insure against are adverse, adverse weather conditions, insects, plant disease, and wildlife. Now, adverse weather conditions, you know, include any acts of God, which include hail, excessive wind, excessive moisture. Uh, drought-like conditions like we're experiencing now in New England, uh, excessive heat, um, basically a hurricane, anything weather-related uh, is, uh, is insured. Uh, insects, you know, is insur insurable, but it's, it, but not due to damage to in, for an insufficient or improper application of pest or disease control measures. 
okay? Um, that's just something you gotta make sure you do. If you're doing normal uh, farming practices and abiding by the rules and have your spray records, and then uh, you're squared away. But that's uh, something that the adjuster would look into if you have a claim open. Uh, an ex a last example I'm gonna use for corn grain, um, just to go over something real quick. Uh, so I have a producer here, uh, corn producer, uh, 300 acres. He planted his 10 year average yield on that farm is 150 bushels an acre. He decides he wants to elect a 65% coverage level. The 2016 corn grain price that's set for this insurance policy is $3.70 a bushel. Uh, his production guarantee for this year will be 29,250 bushels. We get this by multiplying 150 bushel acre average yield by his coverage level, 65%, and then multiply that by uh, how many acres he uh, planted, 300. Now this 29,250 bushels, okay, is production guarantee. If he falls, if he produces corn bushels below that, then he has a claim situation and can be indemnified. If he produced uh, 30,000 bushels, then he's over his guarantee and does not have a claim situation. Um, if, we take, if we take that 29,250, multiply it by the $3.70 base price, then his total dollar guarantee for that policy is $108,225. So if he got totally wiped out due to drought-like conditions we're experiencing here in New England, then that, that's how much he'd be indemnified, 108225 But granted, you'd minus the cost of coverage from that, and that would be his claim check. So let's just say 2016, he harvests all his corn, and he comes up with 19,500 bushels which is pretty much 65 bushels an acre and a 57% loss. Okay, he has a production deficit from his production guarantee of 9,750 bushels. So his gross indemnity for that would be $36,075. We minus the cost of coverage, the premium for that policy of 2,200 and his net indemnity is 33,875. Now, in that scenario, let's go back real quick to the 108,225 total dollar guarantee. We divide that number by 300 acres he planted, that gives us a $360 per acre guarantee, where a good crop insurance plan would make sure that this number that cover your cost per acre. And that's what we're really looking to do, is cover the cost of production. The next uh, crop insurance plan I'm gonna talk about is the fresh market sweet corn. Okay, now this program ensures marketable sweet corn that is considered U.S. number one or better, sold for processing or wholesale or retail, and is planted on or before June 30th, okay? This could include irrigated and non-irrigated land, okay? This is not based on production. It's based on a dollar amount set per acre. An example of that would be at 75% coverage level, you have a $1,976 per acre coverage. Now, be, to be insured, the producer must have grown sweet corn for commercial sale or participated in managing sweet corn farming operation in at least one of the three previous crop years, okay? Uh, this, the perils insured against for sweet corn are the same as the perils insured for the production-based policies, but also the failure to market the crop if that failure is due to actual physical damage caused by an insured cause of loss during the insurance period. Okay, deadline to sign up for this is just like the production-based policies of March, of uh, the annual, like the corn and soybean of March 15th, 2017. Okay, now the way they do this is one container equals 50 years of fresh market sweet corn. Okay, so, and an example of this, if with a $1,976 amount of coverage selected per acre, uh, let's say the producer uh, harvests 70 containers. Now, the price they receive for that container is 1075. Now, for the sweet corn policies, there's a three, $3.75 allowable cost. Uh, now, 1075 minus 375 equals $7 per, per container. So, $70 per 
times seven dollars equals four ninety. We subtract the production account of four ninety from that nineteen seventy six, which gives us a one thousand four hundred and eighty six loss per acre. Cost of that sweet corn policy at that percent coverage level is one hundred and sixty dollars. So that means net indemnity per acre is $1,326 per acre of indemnity. Okay, crop hail coverage. Okay, crop hail coverage is a companion or standalone policy that protects certain annual and perennial crops from only one covered peril, and that would be hail. Okay, in Connecticut, uh, crop hail coverage can be set up for apples, corn, soybeans, and wheat. Okay, uh, and you can also work with the insurance provider and you might be able to set up for other crops, which include peppers, blueberries, and peaches, but that's, that's done on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? So the crop hail coverage is based, is just like the sweet corn policy, it's based on a dollar amount of coverage per acre that you elect, uh, either from $1,000 to $3,000 per acre, and it varies by crop. Two thresholds for setting up the crop hail coverage for, are the excess 15 and 25% and the basic 5% coverage level, okay? You get to choose which acres or blocks that you want to insure. So say you have uh, Honeycrisp apples are your top seller and you just want to protect them without uh, protecting other crops or paying premium on other crop policies, then you can do that, okay? Once again, it's not based on production history. Signups for crop hill coverages occur generally from May through June, depending on certain crops. Whole farm revenue protection, also called WFRP. Uh, this is a risk management safety net uh, that's set up for all commodities on the farm under one insurance policy for any farm with up to $8.5 million in insured revenue. Okay, uh, to set this up, you're gonna need five years of a Schedule F tax form or equivalent. This includes specialty or organic, and those mark into local, regional, farm identity, preserved, specialty, or direct markets, okay? This basically protects against the loss of farm revenue expected from uh, production commodities, resale purchases, and any and all commodities on farm except timber, forest products, and animals for sport, show, or pets, okay? Now, the one thing, key thing with whole farm revenue is that you get the subsidy on the premium decre decreases with the more commodities that you uh, that you can insure. Um, and also, uh, from, if you just have one commodity, you can only insure from 50 to 75%. But if you have two, uh, three or more commodities, you can insure up to 85%. The last, uh, well, not the, not the last, but the next one, I'm gonna talk about pasture, rangeland, and forage. This is still fairly new. Um, and this one is a lot different than the uh, other policies I talked about today. Uh, it basically just ensures against a lack of rainfall within a grid. It does not ensure production, and you can ensure either hay or grazing land. You can do one or you can do both. Uh, not all acres need to be insured. Uh, you can ensure uh, specific grids, and this is based on basically um, an index, a you know, our average rainfall amount within a grid during a certain index interval. Now, uh, you select two-month time frames. It could be May through June, July through August, et cetera. Um, but the key thing for that one is that uh, it's all based on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency's numbers. Um, so you're basically ensuring an, a certain amount of index, and if you fall, if you know, a certain amount of percentage rainfall doesn't, doesn't uh, occur during those two month time frames, then you can be indemnified. That would have worked out for a lot of Connecticut producers if they had signed up for, uh, you know, either June or July uh, or July or August this year because of the drought like conditions where they can only get one, one cut in. Um, uh, deadline to sign up for pasture, rangeland, forage is November 15th. Uh, of 2016 for the 2017 crop year. The last uh, crop insurance plan I'm gonna talk about real quick is the livestock gross margin dairy. Okay, now this program ensures a projected margin, uh, which is projected milk revenue less the projected feed cost of a dairy operation. This is called gross margin guarantee. Okay, now it is the projected milk revenue they're talking about here is not what the producer actually receives. 
Okay, okay. it is the 100 weight of milk insured uh, at the projected class three futures price on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Okay, the projected feed cost, once again, is not what the producer spends on feed. It is the quantity of corn and soybean equivalents to be fed at the projected corn and soybean futures price on the Chicago Board of Trade. Okay, I know that's a lot of uh, a little, a lot of weird information there, but uh, you know this is a, once again a lot different than the uh, you know the normal crop insurance policies that we deal with. Okay, so with the LGM dairy policy, you can insure up to 240,000 hundredweight per policy per year, uh, but you cannot exceed what is actually produced on a monthly basis of your dairy operation. Uh, you can insure from one month to ten months, and the indemnity is based on cumulative months. Okay, an example of uh, of a LGM dairy claim situation uh, right here. Okay, a dairy producer produce insures 5,000 hundredweight for the month of May, just the month of May. The projected milk revenue is $18 a hundredweight, and his fee cost $8 a hundredweight. His gross margin guarantee for this policy would be $10. If at the end of May the contract settled and the actual milk revenue is $16 a hundredweight and fee costs are $9 a hundredweight, the actual gross margin is $7 a hundredweight. The deficit between this gross margin guarantee and actual gross margin results in an indemnity payment of $3 a hundredweight, which would result with you know, 5,000 hundredweight insured, $15,000. Okay, key points with all these crop insurance plans I've talked about, even though it's very broad, uh, main important thing is record keeping. Okay, you must be able to maintain and provide complete records of planting, replanting, inputs, production, harvesting, and disposition of the insured crop. Okay, if there are any claims that equal or exceed $200,000, there's going to be a high dollar claim review by the risk management agency, and all the all the information is going to be re, going to be required, uh, like an audit, to review all those records. Uh, if you cannot comply with the record retention guidelines, then you cannot participate in crop insurance programs. That's just a very, that's a very important thing with crop insurance is the record keeping is something that's, you know, it's going to be hold, held against you in a claim situation if you can't provide accurate records. Okay, the best way of looking at uh, crop insurance and utilization as, you know, as crop insurance as a risk management tool is just, uh, you know, it's not to, it's to su not to substitute a loss of income, but to uh, cover cost of producing a crop. At the minimum, you know, the major input cost. Uh, so that you're able to pay back creditors and uh, secure funding, you know, to farm next year. Uh, and that's basically, what's, you know, what we're trying to do here at Crop Growers is, uh, you know, uh, protect, you know, cap your capital investment in that crop and preserve your farm e equity so you can continue doing what you want to do, uh, you know, next year. Um, and that's all I had today. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. My contact information is, uh, you know, peter.frizzell at cropgrowers.com, uh, along with my number, 860-808-9404. If anyone has any, you know, you know questions in regards to the, uh, the plans uh, that I talked about today, uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, get in contact or meet with you to go over them. Uh, thanks, Pete. I'd like to just put in two cents, too, as well, uh, before we turn it back over to Adam. Um, Pete, you presented a lot of great information, a lot of really complicated information. Um, one of the things that uh, the Risk Management Agency has noticed is that crop insurance participation in the Northeast lags behind other parts of the country. And I think some of that is, is because people get confused by it and the complexity of it, especially when you're talking about crops other than the major row crops like corn, soybeans, wheat, et cetera. Um, and my two cents is that don't let the complexity scare you away. Um, crop insurance agents like Pete are here to explain it and walk you through all the steps. And it may be the case that crop insurance is not for everyone and that it may not make sense for your operation, but please don't fail to consider it just because of the complexity of it. You should, you, you may review it, decide it, it's not, doesn't make sense for what you're trying to do, but you should at least review it and see what your options are out there. And, uh, and like I said, don't let the complexity um, you know, steer you away. For almost anything you're growing or producing um, between the crop insurance programs as well as FSA programs like um, the non-insured assistance program, um, there's probably something out there for you. 
So with that, I'll turn it back over to Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Peter. And, and yes, Chris, you're absolutely right in terms of the complexity of, uh, of the crop insurance programs with the value that they can provide. Um, and so I just want to thank both, uh, you know, Chris and, and Pete for, um, for their, their presentations today. And just going to share my contact information uh, once again here. Excuse me. And just again, reiterate, if you have any questions, if you are interested in help on benchmarking, please do contact me at my email address there, adam.rabinowitz at uga.edu. Um, again, this webinar session is available for viewing if you'd like to view it again at ctfarmrisk.ucon.edu. And I uh, will be having that follow-up video conferencing help if there is, in fact, interest um, so please do email me for details on access for that. And, um, you know, if there are any, any questions to that, I uh, would certainly be, be happy to, to, to help in any way that I can and, uh, you know, on those activities. And so just once again, thank you so much, Chris and, and Peter, for some for very excellent discussion of uh, the crop insurance programs and, and the various data uh, that are available for, for financial benchmarking practices, uh, you know, all very good information to help, help producers in, in Connecticut and others who may be watching this as well.